The Lord Jesus said, For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. During the last days, God has once again become flesh in the east, China. In 1991, Almighty God, Christ of the last days, appeared to do His work and utter His words. Since then, Almighty God has expressed millions of words and carried out the work of judgment beginning from the house of God. God's sheep hear His voice. The people of various denominations who loved the truth and yearned for God's appearance have recognized that Almighty God's words are the truth and that this is the voice of God. They believed that Almighty God was the return of the Lord Jesus, and one by one they came before Almighty God. But how could the satanic regime allow God to come to earth to express the truth and save humanity? Since the Church of Almighty God came into existence, the CCP regime has wildly suppressed and persecuted it. The CCP hates God and loathes the truth vainly attempting to wipe out God's work in the last days. It has issued secret orders many times to mobilize armed police and military to suppress the church. The whole of mainland China rained blood, dark clouds descended, and there was universal outrage and indignation. Today, the Christians of all the house churches, particularly those of the Church of Almighty God, are experiencing even more brutal and bloody persecution by the CCP government. These Christians' bloodshed and loss of life are like a song of victory over the forces of Satan. And they tell the grisly tale of Chinese Christians' persecution. In February 2010, Zhuzhou was cold and damp. Dark clouds filled the sky, creating an oppressive feeling. Inside a Zhuzhou city courtroom, a closed trial against a Christian was in process. This woman is Cheng Rui, a leader in the Church of Almighty God. She was arrested and put in jail in 2009 during a CCP special operation against the Church of Almighty God. She was tortured repeatedly and suffered terrible pain. When their interrogations yielded nothing, the CCP charged her with using a Xiao organization to undermine the enforcement of the law. She was given a sentence of three years and six months. Cheng Rui was born in a small town in northern China. She went to gatherings and read the Bible with her parents ever since she was little. Seeing lots of young brothers and sisters give up everything to work for the Lord was really inspiring for her. She resolved to share the gospel for the Lord when she grew up. The Kingdom Gospel reached Cheng Rui's hometown in 1999. Her entire family read Almighty God's words and recognized it as the truth, as God's voice. They knew Almighty God to be the Lord Jesus returned. Her whole family joyfully accepted Almighty God's work of the last days. 
Cheng Rui started enthusiastically spreading the kingdom gospel with brothers and sisters. But having faith and sharing the gospel in China, where the atheistic CCP rules, puts you in constant danger of being arrested and imprisoned. Cheng Rui had a number of close calls with CCP police. In 2009, the CCP launched a new nationwide special operation against the Church of Almighty God, hoping to eradicate it entirely. Large numbers of Christians in the church all over the country were arrested, imprisoned, and tortured, some even to death. Large quantities of church funds were stolen, and many Christians were forced to go on the run, unable to return home. A terrifying darkness pressed down on all of China, as if it were a devil's dungeon. Cheng Rui was elected as a church leader in 2009. She was in contact with co-workers regularly with her cell phone to better handle the church's affairs. In spite of her many precautions, the police began monitoring her phone. Early in the evening on April 4, 2009, Cheng Rui received an unexpected call. Two co-workers had disappeared after the gathering they'd attended that morning. In the days that followed, there was more and more terrible news of brothers and sisters' arrests. She was well aware that those two co-workers had likely been arrested. And so, Cheng Rui and her co-worker planned on moving the church's books and other items to a safe place as soon as possible. It was raining heavily and the streets were very still. Cheng Rui and her co-worker had no idea that danger was closing in on them. Being pounced on suddenly and arrested was very frightening for Cheng Rui. She silently called on God to give her faith and strength and help her stand witness. Cheng Rui was both surprised and worried to see Sister Wong. She didn't know how many other brothers and sisters had been arrested. Quickly! 
衣服，脱了，快脱！还剩了吗？没有了，磨磨唧唧的，让他出去，<笑>让他出去！告诉你，在这里不分男女，只有犯人。At the Public Security Bureau, Cheng Rui and the others were forced to strip and submit to a search. A male officer was at her side, watching the whole time. She felt both humiliated and angry, but she had to bear it in silence. That night, the police took Cheng Rui and the others to a Zhuzhou Public Security Sub-Bureau for secret interrogations. She had already heard about many other Christians being brutally tortured by CCP police. Thinking of how the police might torture her, her heart quailed. Praying to God, over and over, brought her anxious heart a little peace. 你什么时候到株洲的？都在哪儿聚会？你的上层带领是谁？教会的钱都放在哪儿了？赶紧交代！我信身没有犯法，没什么可交代的。嗯，知道这是什么地方？公安局就是共产党的暴力机构，最好老实交代。说不说？妈的！ The police marked Cheng Rui's case as critical and used physical violence to try to force her to disclose her leader's name. And the location of church funds. Cheng Rui urgently prayed to God and silently resolved that she'd never betray God, no matter how they tortured her. This surprised Cheng Rui. She didn't know when her cell phone was put under surveillance, how much they really knew about the church, or how many brothers and sisters she'd contacted were implicated. These questions were really unsettling for her. As soon as she was suspended, the handcuffs closed tightly about her wrists, and piercing pain hit her in waves. She gritted her teeth and didn't make a sound, but she couldn't keep from shaking all over. She called on God nonstop to give her faith and strength. To help her stand witness, and not become a Judas who betrays God. Seeing Cheng Rui in pain, the police just intensified their torture. At that moment, she felt like her bones were going to break, and she could hardly breathe. The police kept pushing the chair back and forth, suspending Cheng Rui over and over again. When her body was pulled forward, the handcuffs would dig into her wrists and the backs of her hands. Very shortly, her hands were swollen and filled with blood. When the chair was pushed back and the handcuffs loosened on her wrists, the blood would rush back, 
causing her arms to swell and ache. Her head felt like it was about to burst. Meanwhile, the CCP police graphically described their personal favorite torture tactics in order to frighten her. Cheng Rui felt like she was in hell. The police were clearly cruel demons. Cheng Rui would never give up information on the church. This enraged the police. They kept torturing her with the swing. Her hands became swollen to the point that they turned dark purple. As the handcuffed teeth dug into her flesh, waves of piercing pain hit her one after another, making her wish for death. Her vision went black and her consciousness faded. Hearing the officer say this frightened Chang Rui. She was in a strange place, so nobody would know if she was killed by the police. Cheng Rui made a prayer in the midst of her suffering. She thought about how saints had been persecuted through the ages, but they had all borne resounding witness for God. This inspired her, and she resolved to stand witness, even if it meant her death. The police only let Cheng Rui down after keeping her suspended for 12 full hours. She had long since lost feeling in her legs. She couldn't move. There were deep gashes in her wrists, and she had no control over her hands. 
She started to come to after lying there for a long time and said she needed to use the restroom. <laughs> Cheng Rui had been tortured to the point where she lost all feeling in her hands. She couldn't even unbutton her pants. She was in pain and felt helpless. After she'd been in there for a while, a male officer barged in and pulled down her pants in front of seven or eight other male officers, saying the most vile, demeaning things. As a young woman in her 20s, arrested by the CCP police and humiliated in front of everyone that way, Cheng Rui was outraged and couldn't hold back her tears. She cried out, weeping bitterly. The degradation and heartbreak were so overwhelming, she almost didn't want to live. She thought about how her hands had nearly been maimed. If she had to face such humiliation every day, she would rather die. The guardrail was within reach. She wanted to leap over it and end her own life. Curled up on the floor, Cheng Rui silently prayed to God, and her grief and indignation gradually subsided. She realized that the police would stop at nothing to humiliate and torture her, to force her to give up and betray God. If she couldn't handle the torment and ended her life, wouldn't that be falling for Satan's trick? She told herself silently that she would keep on going, even if she only had one breath left. She'd never give in to Satan. The fourth day after her arrest, Cheng Rui's entire body was swollen from torture. Her heart rate was elevated, and her breathing was becoming more and more labored. She was starting to go into convulsions. Only then did the police stop their interrogation. The next afternoon, seeing that she was at death's door, the police had to send her to the hospital. There was no way to continue their questioning. The medical staff were shocked when they saw how swollen her arms and hands were. In the emergency room, the nurse couldn't even find her veins. The injection site immediately swelled up and oozed thin blood. The police's cold brutality angered Cheng Rui, but also concerned her. She didn't know how much longer she could hold on if they kept torturing her that way. She was severely weakened from the torture, but the police still wouldn't let her go. The local criminal police captain and the National Security Division director took turns interrogating her. The criminal police captain showed Cheng Rui photos to identify, most of which were her co-workers. She denied every one of them, 
she didn't sell out her brothers and sisters. Infuriated, the police took turns beating her again. Over the six days and nights the police interrogated Cheng Rui, she hadn't been allowed to eat a single thing. Seeing they couldn't get anything out of her, the police fabricated a confession and physically forced Cheng Rui to put her thumbprint on it. On April 10th, the National Security Division director and two police officers took Cheng Rui to a detention house in Zhuzhou. When the guards saw how badly she was injured, they refused to accept her, afraid she'd die there and they'd be held accountable. She was only admitted after a round of negotiations. Cheng Rui was tossed into a cell where she sat unmoving on the cold floor. She was worried. Since she had no feeling in her hands and legs, she'd be unable to do things for herself. She didn't know how she'd cope with life in prison. Just when she was utterly helpless, to her surprise, Sister Wong, who had been arrested the same day as her, was put in the same cell. Sister Wong took care of her basic needs and massaged her arms every day. And they secretly encouraged each other with God's words. <laughs> The CCP hadn't gotten any information from Cheng Rui, but they still wouldn't give up. Experienced officials from National Security and the State Security Bureau were transferred to Zhuzhou to interrogate her for three straight days. They tortured and questioned her about 18 hours a day. She suffered terrible pain but never told them a thing. Tonight, 
这可能伤着筋了，没伤着骨头。这下手也太狠了。我买了点药，涂上点吧，要不然啊。The police had been savage with Chung Hui since her arrest, but one officer seemed caring toward her. 这要是给你判了刑，你这辈子，你的青春不都毁了吗？听哥一句话。你还这么年轻，人长得也不错，遭这罪，图啥呀？我跟你说句实话，跟你一起被抓的人都已经说了，人家现在都已经回家了。你说。Cheng Rui realized the officer was pretending to be nice to get the information they wanted about the leaders and the church's money. She reminded herself to be on her guard. So she wouldn't be fooled by Satan. Seeing Chung Rui still wouldn't talk, the officer's vicious side came out right away. He didn't stop until she went into convulsions again. Sister Wong was released on bail a month later, but Cheng Rui received an official notification of arrest. Gazing at the iron bars on her window, she wondered how much longer she'd be held. She thought about how she'd nearly been disabled, and was concerned for how she'd get by in the future. She silently prayed to God, asking Him to open up a way out for her. Incredibly, a new prisoner was put into her cell the next day, who started taking care of Cheng Rui after learning about her situation. After she was released, another prisoner offered to care for her. They were practically strangers, yet they continued to help her. Cheng Rui knew this was all arranged by God. She was very moved. And really felt God's care and mercy. In February 2010, Cheng Rui's case was heard in a closed courtroom in Zhuzhou. In June, without any evidence of a crime. She was given a sentence of three years and six months for the crime of using a Xiaojiao organization to undermine the enforcement of the law. The police hadn't allowed her any contact with family since her arrest. She finally got the chance to see family members after her sentencing. Her father rushed to make the long journey to visit. He couldn't hold back his tears at the sight of his daughter, so thin and haggard. Seeing her father look so old and gray pained Cheng Rui. Unable to bear seeing him so sad, she kept comforting him, telling him not to worry about her. On July 9th, 2010, Cheng Rui was transferred to a prison in Hunan Province to serve out her sentence. Once in the ward. 
Chang Rui noticed some of the prisoners were really feeble-minded. The others said they'd been locked up in the disciplinary building, where they'd suffered inhuman torture. When they got out, they'd lost their minds. There was also a place in the disciplinary building reserved for brainwashing, the re-education and conversion unit, where many dissidents and Church of Almighty God Christians were sent. The guards there used all sorts of brainwashing tactics to break their spirits and destroy their will. It wasn't long before Cheng Rui was transferred over to undergo brainwashing. The CCP's torture brutalizes the flesh, but brainwashing brutalizes the mind and spirit. The guards had two other prisoners watch Cheng Rui 24 hours a day. She wasn't permitted to pray and could only sleep three hours every night. The rest of the time, she was forced to watch videos that blasphemed God and promoted atheism, nationalism, and the party, and to write about what she'd learned. If the guards or prisoners watching her weren't satisfied with something, they'd mete out corporal punishment and withhold food. The prisoners on duty at night would torment her by frightening her, keeping her in a state of high stress. The long-term, intense brainwashing and severe sleep deprivation left Cheng Rui mentally foggy and disoriented. The relentless psychological abuse brought her to the brink of collapse. Cheng Rui knew that in that barbaric lair of demons, if it wasn't for God's protection, there's no way she could hold on. Three months later, Cheng Rui was transferred to Ward 2, the Devil's Ward, another place that struck fear in the hearts of prisoners. As long as they could profit, the guards didn't care if prisoners lived or died. The prisoners were forced to perform intensive labor at least 14 hours a day, and over time, was frequent. Meeting the extremely high work quotas was simply impossible. Prisoners were often punished physically or even electrocuted. Some were forced to stand in the sun in 105 degree heat. In the Devil's Ward, 
guards not only harassed, humiliated, insulted, and physically punished prisoners for no reason, but even restricted their bathroom privileges. Cheng Rui was a frequent target for their mistreatment and punishment. She was tormented both physically and psychologically. Her health continued to deteriorate. Many prisoners developed serious illnesses from such a dark life in prison. In the face of such despair and terror, some became mentally ill and some committed suicide. The entire ward was permeated with the oppressive aura of death. Cheng Rui personally experienced that the CCP regarded human life as worth less than a blade of grass. Everyone there felt their hope for life growing more faint by the day. <laughs> Chung Rui's days in prison passed as if in slow motion, every minute and every second dragged on interminably. Over three years of inhumane prison life left Cheng Rui emaciated. Her weight went from around 100 pounds to just over 75 pounds. Though she'd been mentally and physically devastated, she'd made it through with prayer and the guidance of God's words. Cheng Rui personally felt the life-giving force of God's words. In October 2012, her hellish life in prison came to an end. Cheng Rui went back to her hometown and at the village entrance reunited with her mother, who had waited there for a long time. Her mother had been concerned for her safety ever since her arrest, longing for the day she would return home, safe and sound. Cheng Rui could finally be with her family that evening. Cheng Rui's family told her that soon after her arrest, the police searched their home twice. They spread rumors to slander Cheng Rui and put her parents under surveillance. Cheng Rui felt so angry that the CCP could be so evil and shameless, stopping at nothing to persecute Christians. Second, 
Cheng Rui had been released and was at home. But the police had some villagers keep constant watch over her. And the village cadres pressured the family to sign a guarantee that they'd give up their faith. In January 2013, the CCP launched a new wave of arrests targeting the Church of Almighty God. A sister told Cheng Rui that the CCP would arrest and heavily sentence all Christians who hadn't renounced their faith after being released. Some brothers and sisters had already been arrested. Cheng Rui had no choice but to flee her home to avoid arrest. Her father's words were like a knife in Chang Rui's heart. Over all those years, trying to evade arrest, she'd hardly seen her family. Cheng Rui looked at her aging parents, not knowing when she would see them again. She wanted so badly to stay and take care of them, but she had to bear the pain of saying farewell because of the CCP's arrests and persecution. So she resumed her life as a fugitive. In 2016, Cheng Rui fled overseas, where she finally gained true freedom of belief in a democratic country. She's overcome with emotion every time she thinks of what she suffered as a believer in China. The CCP's brutal persecution scarred her for life. And that experience of blood and tears is something that can never be erased from her memory.